Welcome to the first video in my Vector Calculus playlist. The goal of this video is to talk about curves, parameterizations, and specifically the arc length parameterization. These are going to be very frequent objects of study as we go on through Vector Calculus, and I want to make sure that everybody has a common foundation for what these concepts mean, what the terminology and notation that I specifically am going to be using as I go forward in Vector Calculus. Now, back in my multivariable calculus playlist, a link down in the description, I spent a lot more time slowly developing these concepts and going into more depth than I'm going to go into this video. So if you want to know more about curves and parameterizations, check out that playlist. But for here, we're just trying to have a bit of an overview to prep us for vector calculus. I want to begin by considering some curve, a set of points, in this case in the plane. This curve is the unit circle. It could be governed by the equation x squared plus y squared equal to 1. And one of the first things that we're going to do with this curve is give it a parameterization. What this parameterization does is it tells us where all the points on the circle, the, all the points on our curve are located at some specific time t. And we also have to specify that t is in some domain. In this case, I'm going to say between 0 and 2 pi. i hat is the unit vector pointing in the positive x-axis, and j hat is the unit vector pointing in the positive y-axis. And indeed, this represents the unit circle of radius 1 because cos squared plus sine squared by Pythagoras is equal to 1. Now, visually, what I think of when a parameterization is, well, it looks like a little arrow starting at the origin that ends at whatever the r of t is. And then as time goes on, I love to animate my parameter t by actually plotting it at different points in time. As time goes on, it just went around that circle in a counterclockwise way. So what's important here is that the underlying blue curve is just a set of points. It's kind of like saying you have a road and that road just exists on the surface of the planet Earth. But then any specific particle or any car along the road can travel a particular path with particular parameterization in time. For example, this is a different car that travels the same curve but with a different path. It travels it twice as fast. And notice that its parameterization, its r of t, is now cosine of 2t and sine of 2t. And indeed, the t is now between just 0 and pi versus 0 and 2 pi as it was before. So the point is, you can have one underlying curve, that sort of thing that exists separate from how anyone might try to travel along the curve. But you can have multiple different paths and multiple different parameterizations. Note, by the way, that I've drawn my curves with two other little things. First of all, I've drawn a blue arrow on it. The blue arrow indicated that I'm thinking of this curve being traveled in the counterclockwise direction opposed to the clockwise direction. And then the little yellow dot indicates that I was starting at the point 1, 0, and then I went all the way around and I actually ended up at the point 1, 0 again. But in general, a curve could start at some point A and end up at some point B, and the arrow would tell you that you are going from the A to the B. The next thing I want to do is talk about tangent vectors. So if I have a curve, this curve now is a three-dimensional curve in space. At any point along that curve, there is a tangent vector. Well, how do I get this? If I have my parameterization, now I have a three-dimensional parameterization with a g of t, an h of t, and a k of t, I can take its derivative component-wise. So r prime, or the derivative of r with respect to t, is each component being g prime, h prime, and k prime, respectively. And if you think of r of t as the position vector, then it's sensible to call its derivative the velocity vector. So the velocity vector is tangent to the curve at any point. It says this is the direction in which you are traveling, and the magnitude of that velocity gives you the sense of the speed in which you are traveling in that particular direction. The only thing is, it might not be a unit vector, and so it's convenient to come up with a new piece of terminology, which we call capital T, and this vector is just the velocity vector, but normalized. So the velocity vector divided by the length of the velocity vector. And this just tells you the direction of the tangent vector without caring about what its actual length is. And we use this t vector all the time in our formulas. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is to contrast two different types of instructions that I can give you. Imagine in one instruction, I tell you to go five kilometers down some road. And this would mean that if everybody started at the same location, and you say, we want to go and meet at the coffee house that's five kilometers down the road, everyone could go off driving, and it wouldn't matter the speed at which you drove, everyone would end up at the same location because they knew to drive five kilometers. Contrast that with somebody that says, drive five minutes down the highway. Well, if you drive faster than I do, you're going to get further in five minutes than I do. 
And which of these two instructions is better sort of depends on what you're interested in. For example, a police officer might care a lot more not about how far you drove, but at any given moment in time, what was the rate of change of your position vector, i.e. are you speeding? So there's reasons why I might care to know about the specific path that you're going, and there's reasons why I might care about the sort of accumulated distance that you're going along that path. But then that leaves us with the question, well, how do I come up with the formula to talk about instruction A? How do I talk about I've gone five kilometers down the road? I need some measure of this. So the answer to this problem is arc length. The arc length tells you the distance along the curve that you have traveled. And the formula is that you integrate over all the times from A up to B, the square root of the derivative of the first component squared, the derivative of the second component squared, and the derivative of the third component squared. That integrand looks messy, but the good news is the shorthand is it's just the magnitude of the velocity vector. So in other words, the arc length is that you integrate out the magnitude of the velocity vector, and that tells you the distance that you've traveled. Now, what's so wonderful about this is it doesn't matter what parameterizations you choose. At least we have to have some conditions for how nice our parameterizations are going to be. But assuming we have that, it doesn't matter whether you, for example, drive twice as fast as I drive. This formula is always going to give the same arc length. And that makes it independent of the kind of arbitrary choices that we make, like the specific path which we drive along the curve. Arc length is something intrinsic to the curve, not the specific path that you take along the curve. Similar to arc length, I can talk about the arc length parameter. So it's basically the exact same thing, it's just that my limits of integration are going from where I start at A up to somewhere in the middle, some t in the middle of A and B. I have to use a dummy variable tau in my formula now because t is in limit of integration. But basically this says, if you've gone on t equal to, say, five minutes, what is the amount of arc length you've driven? What is the s, s we use for arc length all the time? Well, it's this particular interval. And this is really nice because it gives us a new variable s. s could be our parameter variable. So then that leads to the question, when would I use s, and when would you use t, what I'll call here the time parameter. It's often time, it could mean other things, but particularly in my videos I often like to animate it with time so it's easy to visualize. So why would I use one or the other? Now the arc length parameter has some big things going for it. So as we've discussed, first of all, the arc length parameter is intrinsic to the fundamental geometry of the curve. It doesn't depend on the specific path that the particle makes along that curve. Whereas the time parameter here is reflecting the specific choices for a specific particle on a specific path along this curve. So which do you prefer? Well, again, it just depends on what type of questions you're asking. Arc length parameter does have one really big advantage, which is that there is one choice of the arc length parameter. Everybody agrees on what the arc length parameter is. If I say, go and write down some time parameterization, well, it would be up to you. There's many arbitrary choices. You could drive twice as fast as I did, for instance. Although, if it was a highway, I wouldn't actually recommend that. Nevertheless, there's a sort of objectivity to the arc length parameter that's very convenient. It will be very convenient for making definitions upon which we all agree and aren't dependent on specific choices that we make. But the arc length parameter does have a pretty big flaw, and that's that it's actually really hard to compute. Because it's an integral of a square root of a bunch of stuff squared, those integrals tend to get kind of messy. And they get messy pretty quick so after you leave like the circle and the helix, there's not so many easily able to be done just sort of by pen and paper. So this leaves us with a tension, and here's how we actually resolve it. A lot of times in vector calculus, we are gonna find a new concept via the arc length parameter. It's because we're defining a new geometric concept. We want it to reflect something geometric, and so we make a definition that involves the arc length parameterization because we've got something that captures the geometry and that is sort of independent of any choices that you make, and they're great for definitions. But because those are then thus hard to compute, we come up with formulas to convert that into the time parameterized form and so that we have something we can actually readily do and compute. So we're going to see this over and over again, where we're going to define a new geometric concept with the arc length parameterization, and then convert it into a time parameterization for actually computing it. And we'll see some examples of what exactly I mean by that coming up in the later videos. All right, so I'm going to leave that there. In our next video, we're going to start something genuinely new in our vector calculus playlist, the concept of a line integral. All right, so if you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like. If you have any questions about this video, leave them down in the comments below. I'll do my best to get to them, and we'll do some more math in the next video.